Buenas tardes. Welcome to another PukJ Productions video. I'm Luke. Today we're going to be looking at a site called Sehuite in Peru. It's in the uh, Carahuasi area, the Apurimac region. It's about three and a half to four hours away from Cusco by car, depending on traffic and weather conditions. And uh, I want to apologize uh, at the beginning for some of the contrast issues. Uh, I've done what I can to fix it. My camera was being very difficult on this day. So we'll start here with uh, an artist's representation of the upper or principal stone. Uh, if you you know, look at Sewite on the internet, if you Google it, you very often will just find a picture of this stone. Uh, it's the most representational stone in all of Peru in terms of the amount of figures that are carved onto that one stone. Um, the artist uh, Pedro Rojas Ponce, who uh, drew this illustration in 1955, uh, is also known for his uh, six watercolors on Julio Tello unwrapping a wari mummy, and you can find a video that somebody has made of that uh, superimposed over the actual mummy uh, being unwrapped, which is pretty cool. Uh, Pedro has kindly put all the heads back on the figures, as you'll see here as we look at the actual stone. With the exception of the one puma head, all of the heads have been smashed off, uh, presumably by the Spanish, in an effort to stamp out native heresy. Um, either that or it's some kind of extremely selective weathering process. I can't move on that weathering problem with the heads again, uh, which is very unlikely. Uh, as you can see, there are somewhere between 60 and maybe 70 uh, figures carved onto the stone, uh, as well as all these water channels, stairways, niches, alcoves, platforms, and other areas. Some of the human figures have uh, arrows, and uh, there are all kinds of animals on here, everything from vicuñas, which are a llama-like animal, uh, all the way down to frogs and crabs, and of course the pumas that you can see. Um, these holes on the side it's been postulated that that was to hold in uh, a gold cladding. And uh, my observation of that is that those holes are all connected to water channels that run through this model. And uh, it's probably drainage for that. You'll notice some slight bulging of the, uh, of the video here. It's, uh, it's not you. You didn't overdo your microdosing this morning. Um, it's... Uh, stabilization effect I've used because this is actually phone footage since my video camera was acting up contrast wise. Anyway, that's the intact head in the center there with the puma. And um, this uh, this piece looks a little bit like a like a half avocado, a large half avocado. It's not precisely level anymore, but uh, the thought is that when this was level you could uh, pour water in from the very top and it would distribute the water evenly and precisely down all of the water channels uh, over the rock. Uh, a French traveler explorer, uh, Charles Wiener, uh, was the first to suggest that it was a topographical map of the Andes, um, which I, I doubt, but uh, it's possible, I suppose. Um, when the Spanish discovered this site, there was a, a large hall here. And uh, in that hall, the Spanish described uh, a stash of silver slabs that were 20 feet long, a foot across, and two inches wide, or two inches thick. And, uh, of course, the Spanish said, uh, Chagracias, and uh, removed all of that. Um, and there is... We don't know really the true history, as with many of these things, of this site, but there are uh, various Inca legends and stories from the time of the conquistadors uh, that are interesting. Uh, as I said, when you, you look on the internet, this is pretty much what you see is this stone. There are, however, lower stones, which are also very interesting too, as well as some uh, contemporary uh, or some Inca construction. Um, but you can see it's a, it's a fascinating stone. Um, 
it's been postulated as well that it was uh, created to uh, perfect and understand uh, water distribution. Uh, my feeling is that a lot of ancient sites have something to do uh, with the elements. Most of them, most of the really important ones, have have water running underneath them. I have a feeling that, that sort of like Tupan, I think this is very much a water site. Um, and we'll see some more of why that is in a minute. As you can kind of see in the background, it's it's a it's a beautiful valley too. Um, and uh, it's a very interesting stone for sure. And there's no other stone that is is quite like this. It's a little reminiscent of the, the so-called tired stone at uh, Saxe Woman, and. Uh, I think it's definitely related to those those wakas, those kind of Hanan Pacha, as Jesus Gamar and his father like to uh, categorize them. And I think this fits into that Hanan Pacha time of the, the early uh, monolithic works. Um, so uh, while there is a, a history of the, the Inca using this stone uh, in a religious fashion, uh, again, there's a there's a very fine line in history and archaeology between uh, people using something and people actually creating it, and very often the use of it is enough for archaeologists to say they created it. And uh, you know, I I don't think you can actually really do that all the time. I don't think you it's I don't think it's without you know excruciatingly clear evidence uh, I don't think you can you can really say that uh, here's the valley below this is an Inca construction as you can see on the top of this hill and here's a little little look into the valley beyond um, as you can see uh, typical Inca construction there's been some repair work done here you can see there's some mortar uh, where it has been repaired um, but this is this is fairly typical Inca small stone uh, constructions. Very nice, very even, um, but not megalithic and not cellular or, um, you know, extremely precise in any, in any way, shape, or form. You can see that the platform up there, the, the construction is fairly large. Actually, uh, I decided to walk down the the hillside, and you can see the principal lower stone, uh, known uh, in the native tongue as the the Rumi Huasi, in the distance there. Um, it's probably about a, a quarter mile, quarter mile to a half mile walk from from the top of the hill. It's a pretty high altitude, so it doesn't look like that much of a hike, but you're out of breath by the time you get back, for sure. This uh, series of uh, terraces with the staircase next to it, pardon the uh, contrast there for a second, uh, is what I believe is a water feature. You can see the spout here on the right at the bottom. And what I noticed immediately, this is uh, Ugo, my faithful driver there, walking down the hill once he realized I was going all the way down to Rumi, Rumi Huasi, he immediately retreated to the vehicle. Um, but you can see here, every other layer there's actually, uh, of the terraces, there's actually a, um, a megalithic block in the center that lines up with this water spout at the bottom. And uh, my immediate thought seeing that was, uh, is that older than the construction around it? Because we see that in South America a lot. Uh, you know, Tiwanaku, well, uh, most places where there's Incan construction, they're building around older stuff. And in this photograph from a distance, you can see just about every other level, there's a, a, a megalithic block in the center. So here we are approaching the, uh, the Rumi Huasi. Um, again, this is Hanan Pacha work, uh, very similar to Hanan Pacha stuff you find around Cusco. Kenko, Saxiwaman, uh, Temple of the, the Moon, all kinds of places, uh, Oyente Tambo, have at, Machu Picchu have at the center 
of the important areas, stones like this, monolithic stone with interesting shapes carved into them or removed from them, uh, that are then usually have uh, some kind of cellular structure built around them. Uh, and then after that, you find Inca construction built around that and very often trying to finish or complete or repair uh, what I can only imagine is, is a much earlier construction. This stone, the Rumi Huasi, there are some legends about it. Um, while I was researching it, I tried very hard to find any reference to when that stone broke in half. And I cannot find anything that mentions that stone being whole while the Inca were using it and breaking afterwards. Um, there is a, a very disconnected uh, legend about um, it being struck by lightning, but I couldn't find any real evidence to correlate that. And it's, it's set in a low part of the valley, and there doesn't seem to be any sort of scorching marks that you would... Uh, perhaps connect with lightning. So what's interesting about this stone, or one of the many things that's interesting about this stone, is the, the legend that comes with it. Um, if you look hard enough, and it is hard to find information about this site, but uh, uh, Pizarro's cousin... Francisco Pizarro's cousin, Pedro Pizarro, had a soldier who was captured by the Inca. His name was Francisco Martin, or Martin. And while he was uh, a captive of the Inca, he was brought to this site by Manco Inca, who consulted the spirit at this huaca. Now, a huaca is a place where a spirit resides, or the power of the land is uh, embodied. And there are many legends of uh, Incas talking to the spirits at these huacas. So this story uh, of Francisco Martins is that while he was captured, he witnessed Manco Inca speak to the Apu, the spirit of this huaca, and he heard the spirit answer him. After which Manco Inca turned to him and said, See how my God speaks to me. Which would be a terrifying thing probably to witness, especially for a Catholic. You know, this is immediately the devil. This is, of course, what the Catholics thought of all of this stuff. Uh, and there are other legends that go with this too. Apparently somewhere on this site there was a, a large pole that had a gold band, fatter than a very fat man, wider than a very fat man, with a gold band about the width of a hand around it and two gold breasts to which they attached uh, a dress and daubed it with sacrificial blood and prayed to the spirit, the Apu, at this huaca whose name was Apurimak. Um, now, I don't know where that um, pole would have been. Supposedly there were smaller poles around it uh, made up the same way. Um, Apu, as I, it was explained to us by uh, an indigenous woman, means mountain spirit. So I would assume that Apu Rimak would be a, a mountain spirit named Rimak. Uh, but Apu Rimak also is taken to mean an uh, oracle that speaks greatly or speaks clearly. The other story uh, related to this site that I was able to find was that of Asarpe, who was uh, a high priestess here in the time of the conquistadors, who after the Spanish desecrated this site, uh, covered her head and threw herself from a, a high cliff near the suspension bridge, calling on Apurimac as she fell. Um, this is the side of the Rumihuasi. You can see the channels that come from a bowl cut into the top surface that runs down the side and into these boxes uh, in the center here. According to Hemming and Ranny in Monuments of the Inca, this was for ritual effluence, by which I presume they mean mostly blood. There's no sign of any blood uh, in the stone, any blood stains, any old stains, but it's been a very long time. 
I suppose it is possible. Be a good name for a band, wouldn't it? Ritual, this is my band, Ritual Effluence. We're on at 11. In the background there you can sort of see the Cyclopean Wall described by Charles Wiener. As you look at the um, the Rumi Huasi here, you just... Obviously it's not level anymore, but the precision, the beautiful leveling, the way that if you look at that bottom level there, it looks like something's supposed to be inserted in there, doesn't it? Whether that could be a, a gold or silver uh, cladding or something more functional, I don't know. But the curves, the levels, everything's very smooth and sort of vitrified feeling. And uh, just beautiful work, really beautiful work, and it's still in amazing condition. Here we can see uh, the break at the bottom and some of the designs or shapes that have been cut into the top. Again, this is very specific. This is not like Inca, Rog, and Trev you know, one day on the top of the rock. Oh, hey, Rog, uh, what kind of shot? I'll tell you what, I'll cut three circles and you do like two circles and like an oblong thing with a semicircle at the top. You know, obviously that's not what's, what's going on here. Whether these were used as bases for something or whether they had inlays in them uh, of gold or silver or electrum or something like that. But again, they are specific shapes and it's... It's my thought that you could possibly uh, stand um, maybe celestial markers in those spots. I mean, look at what a specific shape that is at the top as well, and that perhaps at certain times of years a certain marker in there might uh, might help mark the passage of the stars or planets. It's hard to say with a modern eye. This right here is I find very interesting too. Uh, when I took this photo, this was the first one of these I'd ever seen in terms of that bowl cut in and the channel coming out or running down the side. And um, so I took this picture, didn't think too much about it. And then several weeks ago, one of our subscribers on YouTube, Patrick Malloy, thank you Patrick, sent in unrelated uh, a video. Um, and in the background, towards the end of the video, I happened to see something uh, that caught my interest, and it was this. Now, this is a freeze frame I took from about 13 minutes and 20-something seconds into this video, and I saw that. And I thought, right, I've just seen that a couple of months ago in Peru. This is, of course, at the very top of the Great Pyramid in Egypt, uh, courtesy of a slightly German guy who free climbed the pyramid and took some photos and video while he was up there. Uh, and amidst all the unglaublichs, uh, I spotted that and looks the same to me. I, this, what correlation can you make? What can you say? You can't say anything, but it is interesting. This is what I like to call the Inca love seat since everything's a throne in the original, the orthodox story. But again, just the precision uh, the vitrified surface, uh, you know, everything everything was done here on purpose. You can see that uh, Cyclopean wall there in the background, uh, so described by Charles Wiener. Um, we'll get to that in a second. This I found very interesting. At first I thought this might be an altar. You can see that the top left of that has been cut out, and there's a stone, we'll see in a second, lying in front of that. It's a very marshy area where I actually lost a shoe, which I reclaimed so that it wouldn't be attributed to the Inca uh, many years from now. But in retrospect, I have a feeling that that is actually an entrance into the hillside that has been blocked. Uh, I have no proof of that, but that is my feeling, uh, is that behind that stone you may well find uh, an entrance into a mound uh, there. This is a, a modern channel, I believe, um, but you can see how much water runs through underneath and around this site. Um, and this is very important at ancient sites, and you see it at most of the very important ones, water running underneath the site. This is important, I believe, energetically. This is one of the stones that has come out, been removed from this wall. 
and this is very different from the rest of the Inca construction, the small stone, you know, sort of slapped together Inca construction that we see everywhere. This is different. This is much more like the Cori Concha. They're larger stones. They're fit together very precisely. You can see there's very limited gap even now between the stones. Uh, and I believe this is what um, Charles Wiener was describing when he talked about the wall sunk into marshy ground, the Cyclopean wall. And I believe he used that terminology because of the Greek walls that you find that are polygonal and or put together very, very closely like this with much larger stones. And the ancient Greeks had no memory of who built that, so when asked, uh, they would always say, you know, the Cyclops uh, built these. So that type of structure over there became known as Cyclopean, and you see that same type of structure here. As a lay moron of the archaeological arts, I would say excavate this hill on the right behind this wall. I think you'll find a lot of stuff. That's where that uh, possible entrance to the mound it's on the other side of that stone to the right, just around the corner, goes into the side of that hill site. And I have a feeling that uh, you would find some interesting stuff if you had a, a little poke around under there. This stone was uh, once part of the Cyclopean wall here. You can see the L shape has already been cut, and it's similar to this stone, which you see at uh, Silistani, the Chulpa Towers, but also many stones from the older sites older than Inca. This is a, a platform in the background here that may well have been the hole that had the silver slabs in it. Uh, it's hard to tell. Uh, but very Inca construction. Not terribly challenging. And these two guys um, who were on their way home and uh, <laughs> were very excited and happy to see uh, a random sunburned gringo uh, checking out these rocks. And they're uh, my Spanish is terrible, and their English was equally good, but I was able to learn from them that are, there are similar stones within a, a 5 to 8 kilometer area around here. They may have been talking about Inca Huasi. I'm not sure. Uh, but there is other stuff to go back and look for and discover in that area, and I hope to do that uh, at some point in the future. Uh, overall, a, a remarkable site. Uh, some beautiful things. Uh, left behind here uh, a place of, of energy and uh, I recommend uh, visiting it yourself thank you for watching uh, stay tuned for future Puka J Productions video check out our YouTube and our website and we hope to see you soon mm -hmm.